Okay, we're good here. Okay, a um, couple of quick points. One is uh, just wanted, um, I was in Europe when you took the exam, so I uh, wanted to get a sense. How many of you think that the exam is too easy? Okay, how many of you think the exam is too hard? And how many of you um, were still, uh, did not finish the exam? Okay, so that's good to know. Um, we're, uh, we're, going to, we're going to be grading in the next few days, but uh, this helps us to kind of think through what's, uh, what's happening. Um, one of the things that um, you know, with, uh, I, I want to really encourage you guys is that um, you know what, uh, when you code these things, play with the code a little bit, okay? And you know, think about some of the variations so that um, you know, don't just you know, code what we taught in the class. You know, this is a programming class. So ultimately, we have to help you to be able to take a problem, break it down, and code it, right? So, so that's why we have to help you to, you know, to be able to think through these things, especially when you take interview questions from some of these companies. These are the kind of questions that you're likely going to see, okay? So, so that's why we're not trying to, to you know, to, we're not trying to, to, uh, to trick you or trying to, you know, to make you feel bad but we're really just trying to uh, help you to be strong in terms of your uh, future, future uh, interviews and so on. So today we have two things. Uh, one is um, Carl is going to be doing a project kickoff, and um, uh, this, is, uh, this is one of the changes we did this semester. We're kicking off the final project a lot earlier uh, than the previous semesters. So this gives you more time to be able to you know, really get uh, some good thinking into the pro uh, project, okay? And uh, that was the number one feedback we got from the previous students, is that they all said that the project was great, but they, want, they would love to have some time to be able to look more into the background and to be able to play with things a little bit more. So that's why we did a lot of adjustment this semester, just so that you can start the project early. And the second one is, um, after call, I will uh, go into the code that you are going to uh, need to touch in the project, so I'm going to begin to talk about the sequential code of the convolution layer and then the kernel code of, for the convolution layer so that in the next few weeks, you will be able to make the milestones uh, with all the good uh, uh, intellectual and the conceptual understanding of what needs to be done. Okay, so Carl, take it. Yeah, so I think if you might have to turn that off before my mic is going to work. Hello, hello? It seems so quiet. Hello? Okay, well, the room's not too big in any case, so let me know if I need to speak up. But, so, uh, I'm Carl. I'm one of Wenmei's senior PhD students. I think I came in here once before and helped record a lecture, or gave a, one of the lectures. Um, so uh, we're going to start the project today, and um, so I'm going to go through kind of the project landing page, uh, some of the due dates, the milestones. All of this information is on the landing page, so don't feel like you have to absorb it all now. I'm going to throw a lot of stuff at you, but I just wanted to give everyone a chance to see this. So basically what we're doing in this project is we're implementing a fast GPU convolution layer in a neural network framework called MXNet. And uh, so we talked a little bit about neural networks in this class. Um, but when people are writing and using neural networks in practice, they don't write all of the code from scratch in CUDA C like you've been doing. Um, you may have noticed that it's kind of nitpicky and there's a lot of opportunity to make silly mistakes. And so people who aren't experts in CUDA are going to have no hope of you, you know, writing actual high performance code. So they use uh, sort of these library or software packages to write the neural networks for them. And I'll show you an example of kind of how these things are used. But internally, of course, someone's responsible for implementing the convolution in CUDA so that it can run on a GPU. And so that's what you're going to get a little bit of experience doing in this project. And so what I kind of hope that you get out of this is you'll get a chance to demonstrate that you learn some optimization techniques through the class. Um, but, you know, this is also sort of the new hotness, right? And so you can go into interviews uh, and 
go into in, yeah interviews for your internships and or if you're going into grad school and be able to say you know I have experience with some of these with this neural network framework in the internals I've written CUDA code for it uh, and people will find that pretty impressive uh, not a lot of people have some experience putting neural networks together but not a lot of people have mucked around inside the internals and understand the performance so that's also kind of the other reason uh, that we're doing this in a real neural network framework so uh, really quick um, the first milestone is going to be due on March 7th, so it's not too long from now, but actually you don't really have to do anything for this milestone. So uh, in this milestone, we're using a software package called Rye that I will talk a little bit more about instead of WebGPU, so it's somewhat similar. Um, but all we're really trying to do is make sure that this like works for you before the project gets started properly. Uh, so you don't, really, you don't really have to do much for this. You have to download the software and like use your profile and run it. Um, so two weeks after that, we're going to have another milestone. Uh, and so these milestones are kind of to help you along. It's totally fine if you go faster than this. Um, but what we're going to do in the second milestone is write a CPU implementation of the convolution. And so Wenmei is going to talk about that today. Um, but again, this milestone should be pretty light. You can essentially take the code from the textbook and drop it in to the skeleton code that we've provided, and it should basically work for you. Um, but this will kind of make sure that your whole environment is set up right. You can compile your own custom code and run it and know what to look for and stuff like that. So the, first, uh, the third milestone is kind of the first maybe more serious one. Uh, and so we're going to, instead of using the CPU code, we're going to have a GP, GPU code. So you're going to have to write a kernel. And at this point, it doesn't really matter how fast the kernel is or how much you optimize it or anything like that. Um, we just kind of want to see it working. And we want to see a little performance preview analysis. So see that you are able to use some of the sort of standard CUDA performance analysis tools uh, that will also be introduced in this project to, sh to uh, understand how fast your code is running. Uh, and so that'll be, you know, three or four weeks after that. So you've got a lot of time to do that. This is why we're starting this project so early. And then finally, we all have a, the final milestone before the project is due is we want to see uh, at least half the, work, half the work done for the project by this point. So what we're going to be doing is we're, we have a set of optimizations that we encourage you to try and techniques to try. And we want to see at least half of those done. Uh, and also with some performance analysis for this milestone. And then the final submission, uh, you'll have everything done. And uh, so that, that Friday is, I think, the last day of finals. So, um, so we can just kind of jump right in here. So this is the project landing page, and you're welcome to go here now if you'd like. Uh, let's see, did this work? Great. So it's a GitHub repository that's hosted on here. Um, and so the README is quite long, but it describes in excruciating detail everything that you're supposed to do. So if you have any question, I encourage you to you know, look through here, scan through it first before you ask me uh, or ask on Piazza. But there's a lot of stuff here, and I know that people overlook stuff all the time. Um, so basically, the, yeah, so this, this, uh, this is the landing page. And it has the README and all the skeleton code that you'll need. And so, for example, what you can do is to start off your project. Can everyone see this? Is this like bright enough? Maybe I can. Ah. <laughs> um, so you're going to go. And this is a public repository, so you don't need a GitHub account. But where's my download? You're going to go and grab this. And this is going to be the basis of your project folder. Uh, so this is going to have all the stuff that you need in it to get started. So, um, And you can see all that in here. And what do I want to do next? The other thing you're going to need is on this project page, there's something called Rye. And that is the software that you're going to use to submit this project instead of um, WebGPU. And the reason that we use this instead of WebGPU is because in WebGPU, you know, you're constrained to editing a single file. Um, we don't really have control. Uh, we don't have a lot of flexibility in the kinds of software that we can use behind the scenes in WebGPU. So we have this separate system called Rye uh, 
Uh, and instead of working through a web browser, it works through a command line terminal. So we have binaries here for uh, Linux, uh, Mac OS, and Windows. And so I'm just going to download this now as if I were you. And so, for example, um, I need to extract it. And then you can see there's the RI, the RI file there that got extracted. So right now that's not executable. So I need to make it executable. And then either I can run it directly, right? Or it needs to be in my system's path. So in one of these locations. Um, and so, you know, you can, you can kind of look for how to do this. But on my system, this is in the path. So you can see that it's there. And so now. So now I can do ry and um, does this work? <laughs> so ry is this command line tool that you'll be using to submit everything. And so the most straightforward way to do it is I, you have to tell ry which project folder you want to submit. And so that's the project folder that you downloaded from GitHub. And so for example, I can say, I'm, I'm, my current directory is in the project folder right now. So I can set, tell Rye to do this current directory. And so what happens is that Rye takes your folder, compresses it, uploads it to AWS, so Amazon's web service. Then we have some servers running. And then Rye contacts our servers and says, you know, I've uploaded this project folder. Our Rye servers grab that folder copy them over to their server, download it, extract it, and run a set of instructions on our servers. So our servers have GPUs and CUDA and stuff. So that's how the CUDA code gets executed. And then you'll see our server streams back the results in real time back to you. So this is uh, my code compiling. So you're going to be editing MXNet. So the first thing that happens is that MXNet gets partially recompiled with all the changes that you make. Uh, and then down here at the bottom, we're running the scripts for the first part of the first milestone, so milestone 1.1. And so you can see that uh, it loads our data set, it loads our model, and then it does this inference and gets this result. And so what I just did is essentially all you need to do for the first milestone. Um, so let's see, what did I have next? Right. So the other thing that we need is there's something called a profile file. And that tells Rye who you are uh, and sort of authenticates you to use it. So did everyone get an email this morning with a profile file? Did that happen? OK, so that should happen shortly. Um, yeah. Yeah, we have a, a research scientist in the group who said he was going to send those out. So what they'll look like, though, I have one, of course. So. So you'll get a file that kind of looks like this. Um, and so this file is going to have uh, your email in it and your username. Um, and so it has these access keys and secret keys. And so don't share your secret key with anyone like I'm doing with you now. Don't do that. Uh, but what you will need to do for the first milestone is right here where it says team name. And this is in the readme. You'll have to work with your team to pick a name and put it here in your RI profile files. And everyone should have the same name. And then the other thing you'll need to do with your name is tell us what your name is. And we have a handy dandy form that you can go and fill out. And so you'll put your net IDs in. And then you'll put your team name in. And so the team name, I want like ASCII characters only, no Unicode, please, lowercase, no spaces, no dots. No commas. Uh, just keep it. Just keep it real simple. Last year we had we had some great people who uh, they had like new lines in their team name, and so I was like trying to script up all the grading stuff, and I had to add in all these edge cases, and made it take like three times as long. And uh, so none of that is allowed anymore. <laughs> no Unicode either. So yeah, but you know you can still you can still have have good fun with it. Um, and let's see. So, right, so you'll have to tell us what those are. Um, 
And so I talked about this a bit. But yeah, so this Rye profile file is going to, you're going to get it in your email. And on um, Mac OS or Linux, you'll need to put it here. So that's in your home directory. And then I think on Windows, the similar syntax is here, is like this. So it needs to be in your home directory. That's where the Rye client's going to go looking for it, so it can find it. Um, so the other thing is, there's a possible bug in the Windows version of the Rye client where if you pass it, like I was doing, uh, a relative path, it might not work. Uh, so you may have to pass it an absolute path. So like, you know. But I can't remember if that was fixed or not. So if Windows, if you're trying to do Windows and it like seems to zip up a file that's too small and nothing happens, that, that could be the problem. Um, great. Uh, so I've got it. OK, yeah, so, so really quick, I'll go over sort of what we're expecting in these milestones. Um, so you're going to run, there's two, oh, so let me show you this too, actually. So in the project folder for the first milestone, we have um, milestones 1.1 and 1.2 here, these Python scripts. And so you won't need to edit, you really won't need to edit these Python scripts at all. But um, uh, so these Python scripts are kind of going to do, do all the work for you. You'll need to edit uh, some C++ code. But so for the first milestone, we have these two scripts. And for the second milestone, we have this one. For the third one, we have this one. Fourth one, we have this one. And then there's a final also. And I believe milestones two through final, they're actually all the same. But if I didn't make a bunch of scripts, people would ask me, you know, how come I don't have a milestone three script? So now you do, even though it's the same as the milestone two one. Um, so for the first milestone, you're going to run the CPU code and the GPU code. And so MXNet has a built-in convolution layer, of course. Uh, so all we want to see here is that your scripts are going to use those convolution layers, which just basically double checks that the Rye environment is working and you kind of know what to expect. Um, but for each milestone, the key thing is you're going to write a report. So you're going to have a single report. It's going to be a living document. It doesn't matter who from your team uploads it. Um, but the report is going to be in your project folder so that when your project folder gets uploaded, we'll see your report in there also uh, when we go to grade it. Uh, and you're gonna, this is where you're going to include all the stuff for all the milestones. So for milestone two, it'll have the same stuff that it had in for milestone one plus some more stuff. So it just kind of keeps getting longer and longer as the project finishes. Uh, and so you'll need to write this file with a few things described in the readme. Um, but so this, the client's going to check that you have a file named report.pdf, but please actually make that a PDF file. Um, because that you know, makes my job easier. Some people last year had a text file that was called report.pdf, and I would try to open it and like, just, you know, just like one more thing I had to figure out. <laughs> so um, <laughs> please, please do that. <laughs> um, and so you can submit jobs through Rye, uh, just like I was showing, like this. But when you want to sort of tell the teaching staff that, oh, here's a job that I think we're done with and we want to grade for a particular milestone, you'll add an additional flag to Rye. So say I want to submit milestone one. Um, and what that, the difference there is that you no longer get to choose the steps that Rye executes. And I'll go back and show you that. But we have specified steps that Rye is going to execute similar to the steps that you have. Um, and also, Rye is going to e execute a golden copy of code that you're not supposed to change. So it's really only going to take the code that you change and stick it, or the code that you're supposed to change, and stick it in a known good framework and run it. Uh, so as long as you sort of stay within the bounds of where you're supposed to be working, uh, the submission process should be totally pain free. But actually, you can see here, I don't have a report in my project folder because I just downloaded it. Right, so it says that. So let me make that really quick so I can show you. So there. Um, so, so this is kind of doing the same thing as before. But uh, so I need, I'll, I'll need to show you these steps that you can edit the recipe that Rye follows to execute your code uh, next. But you can kind of see some of them here, but I'll show you them in context. So, so this, takes a, this takes like a minute to recompile because it has a lot of stuff.
And I'll show you the skeleton code and where you're supposed to make the changes to. Yes? If you never use the submit flag, you will get a zero. So do it at least once. <laughs> uh, probably if you never use the submit flag, what will actually happen is I'll email you. It seems like you never use the submit flag. Um, but you know. So yeah, so you can see that this runs uh, and yeah, it does everything that's supposed to do. So one other key thing is that this link at the end is an image of what your project folder looks like after all of your code runs. So if you print messages to a file or dump data to a file or use the timeline profiler to create profile data that you want to visualize, you can just follow this link and download that so that you can look at it on your own computer. Does that make sense? Since we're executing this remotely, you know, you need a way to get the results back. So that's what that is. So, so we can look. So this is inside your project folder. You'll see a file called Rye Build, and this tells Rye what it is that you want to do and how you're going to do it. And so you don't really need to change anything here except this bottom stuff potentially. Um, this line is the Docker environment that the project code executes in. So this Docker environment, for example, has a mostly built version of MXNet. It has like the golden source files. It has the data sets and all this stuff. So don't change that. Although if you want to, you can create any pro you can create any folder and create any set of steps in here and any Docker image, and Rye will like happily execute it for you. So if you want to mess around with it a bit and execute some other code on Rye, it should work for you. Um, but basically what this says, this is the steps that Rye executes in sequence. And so this, the syntax here is like Linux bash shell. But so you can see that here what it's doing first is there's a folder on the Docker image called this, and this has the golden version of the files. So first it takes the golden version of the files and puts them in the MXNet source code. Then it takes your files and puts them in the MXNet source code. And then it builds MXNet. So it builds your files into MXNet. And then it installs the Python bindings of MXNet. And then it uses the Python bindings to execute your code. So that's the steps. And so you could put in like, now I could delete all this stuff and just say, I can say anything. And so we can't do submission then, because if we do submission, it uses a different Rye build file that we specify. But I could just run this one, and there you go. So you can put anything you want in there. Um, so that's the steps that you're supposed to, that's the place where you can modify. But you, don't, you shouldn't need to modify that if you don't want to. What you really do need to modify for the project is the skeleton code. And that code lives in here. And so these two files define the, the uh, CPU version of the convolution and the GPU convolution of the version, or of the, uh, the G GPU version of the convolution. So for example, in the CPU one, uh, this function is already defined for you. So this is the forward pass implementation of the convolution. That's all you need to do. There's no backwards pass for this project. But you can see it takes a, uh, um, this uh, input array y and this input array x, uh, and then the um, convolution kernel weights. And so what you can do is this, this comment kind of gives you a hint as to how the, the data is laid out. But you know, you're know you going to look in chapter 16, and you're going to see there's a bunch of loops that kind of look like this. And you can just drop them in here and run it. And so that's what you'll need to edit for that part. And then we have a similar file for the GPU code. And so for example, this is the function that's invoked on the host. So this is like kind of where you can think you would write your host code. And uh, you know, so for example, we could set up the grid and block dimensions and call a kernel if we wanted to. Uh, and we can define a kernel here. You know, you can define multiple kernels. Um, you could allocate more memory here if you wanted to. So one difference is going to be that these uh, incoming data are already going to be on the GPU for you for this project. So if you want to allocate more stuff and put it on the GPU, you can do that with CUDA malloc, but you don't need to move these guys over to the GPU. They're already there. 
because MX this is in the context of the big MXNet software framework, and so that framework handles all that for you. Uh, and backing that out is a little more complicated than I wanted to try to tackle. Maybe maybe next year. So, so yeah. So similar, you just write your CUDA code in here and run it. And there's also an implementation. So all we expect you to do is do it for floats. MXNet will naturally try to compile a version of this for like half precision, double precision, all this stuff. But that makes it a little more complicated for you to write your code because then it has to be generic enough to work that way. So you just have to worry about it for floats. This implementation captures everything that's not floats. And so you can see you don't need to do anything. Oh, actually, I should not put this here. I'll, I'll make this change. But you don't need to edit this code. This just is an assertion that fails if this code should ever be executed. So don't mess with that. Just do the float version. Okay, makes some sense. Um, great. So that's uh, that's kind of the the big picture. Let's see. I could go through the rest of these milestones. Um, the key thing about the milestones is they have what you're supposed to do in the README, but just keep updating the same report. Um, and then I guess one thing. Do do I have a few more minutes? Yeah. Okay. So I could show. Uh, okay. Okay. So I'll try to show you a little bit of NV. Um, I don't know if I prepared an example. Maybe I should talk about the rubric instead. <laughs> um, so the way we're going to... Okay, sure. That sounds good. Uh, yeah, I can put a little demo of that together. That'll probably work out better anyway. Oops. Let me make this a little bigger. Okay. So here, here's the basic idea. So we're assigning, uh, oh, I don't have milestone four on here. OK, I guess this is going to rework slightly. But the basic idea is that these early milestones are supposed to be enough of the grade that you know hopefully everyone gets all of those points, but it shouldn't really make or break the project. Um, but what we're going to do is for the optimizations, um, we have a list of different optimizations that we think are worth attempting. And so you're going to get. 10% of your project grade for how good of a job you do on each of those. Uh, and then there's some points reserved for, I mean, you know how some people are. People love to go crazy. And so there's some points reserved for extra detailed analysis and insights of these optimizations or additional high effort optimization work. Um, we want to be able to reward that. Uh, one other component of this project is that we are going to rank all of your implementations by performance. And there's 10% of the project grade reserved for that. So in the past, this was a lot more of the project grade. And we got some feedback that maybe that wasn't the best. So now it's 10%. Um, and I'd be happy to hear any opinions that you have on that, too. But basically, what we're going to do is every team at the end, we're going to run all of your code and rank them against each other. And the best performing team, you know, roughly speaking, will get that entire 10%, and the worst performing team will get none of that 10%. Um, and so th there's, a, there's a way for you to see how fast your code is in comparison to everyone else in the class. Uh, but we don't really need to worry about that for several milestones. Um, so you, know, you can try all these optimizations, but uh, there's definitely more you can do than the suggested optimizations. And also, there's better and worse ways to implement the suggested optimization. So, if you're interested in trying to get a lot of that 10%, then you know by all means, go for it. And so we're also going to reserve some points for uh, making the report better. I mean, like believe it or not, last time some people didn't have their names in the report. So like just you know put your names in your report, <laughs> put your team name in the report. <laughs> I would download these reports and I'd be like, who are, who are these people? <laughs> and that's not something you want your grader to be asking. Um, so for each optimization. Uh, it has to be right, first and foremost. Oh, so the other thing is the ranking is if your code is not right, you get zero. So, um, And also, I think probably what we're going to do is we're going to allow extensions, but you get 0% on the ranking score if you take the project extension. That, that seems fair, right? So, um, um, But then also, we're going to reserve some grade for how well you justify the optimization, why you think it was necessary, and how good your analysis of it is. So don't neglect that part either in the report. Um, I guess the idea for the ranking is that we're going to, yeah, go for it. Uh, 
Um, so the accuracy shouldn't change. Uh, even uh, so, last year, out of all, even the people who did the most zany esoteric optimizations had the exact same accuracy out to the same decimal places. So we don't expect if your accuracy is not exactly what it says on there, uh, is not exactly what it should be. Uh, you probably have a bug. Um, good question. So what we're going to do is we're going to determine the median performance of the class. So that kind of says how well you all did as a whole. And then we're going to basically rank you based on how many standard deviations above or below that you fall. So it's pretty straightforward. Um, right. So what you're going to do, essentially, by the time you have your final report, you're going to have all of the normal milestone content. And then you're going to have, for each optimization, I want to know how you identified it, why you thought it would make sense before you tried it, um, the effect of it, and whether it was, in fact, good or not. And uh, last year, I wasn't super picky about people using profiling tools to do this. But I think this year, I would like to see people using the profiling tools to evaluate how good their optimization was. So you can run them on the version before your optimization and after your optimization and compare the difference. They give you all kinds of statistics that I guess I'll show you next week. Um, any reference, external references that you use. So um, we don't want you taking code from anywhere else, of course. The point is that you're supposed to demonstrate that you know what you're doing. But optimizing convolutions is a topic on GPUs, is of course a topic that is not a very novel one. And so you will be able to find various algorithms and papers and so on and stuff out there. And if you decide to try one of those, uh, I think that is totally fine, but you know, you should cite it. Someone else's work, right? So, um, and then if you want non-anonymous suggestions for next year, you can put them in your report. If you want anonymous suggestions for next year, we'll have a anonymous way for you to submit those some other way. But it won't be through Rye, because I get to see who makes all those submissions. Um, so that should be pretty straightforward. I mean, I'm not putting like a length limit either on the high or low side on this report, but you know, be concise, be straightforward, do all the stuff that you need to do. It worked out fine in the past, so I'm optimistic about that. Um, Andy is working on implementing this capability, so when that's working, we'll describe that. There's going to be a command in Rye where you can see where you fall compared to everyone else. Um, you can get some extra debug and verbose output if something doesn't seem to be working. And if it's not working, that's probably the first thing I or the TAs will do, so you may as well try it first as well. Um, so also, the Rye client may receive, will receive some updates because, for example, Andy's not done with all this yet. So you'll just have to go. I'll update the link in the GitHub, but I'll, we'll post on Piazza or make an announcement in class or both that you have to go and download the newest version of the Rye client. Uh, so you can get all the functionality or if there's bug fixes and so on. And you know, I'd like that to happen zero times during the semester, but it will probably happen three, four times, something like that. We'll run into bugs, you know. So just uh, we have plenty of time to get that stuff ironed out before crunch time. So bear with us. Um, I think I can skip that. There's a batch size in your Python script, but you don't really need to modify the Python script. So OK, great. So that's, that's really what I have. These slides will be up there uh, as well on the, on the course website. So yeah, any, any, any immediate questions? I know that was a lot, but it's all on the readme too. Yes? Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to take whatever the latest submission from your team was. So you can have one person doing the submissions on your team. Uh, you can say, this time I'll do it. Next time you do it. doesn't really matter. I'll just take the latest one from your team. So yeah. OK. Well, thanks. And so um, I really put this project together and did a lot of stuff with the client. So the TAs may be able to help you, but you can email me uh, at that address. And we, I'm also happy to talk to you about the project. If you have some ideas, we can set up, set up an appointment. Um, it is easy to find my office address online, but if you just wander in, A, there's a good chance I won't be there because I have a lot of different meetings. And B, uh, if I am there, I'm probably like trying to work on something and don't necessarily want to be interrupted randomly. But if you email me, we can definitely set up a meeting. So I would, yeah, I would appreciate that approach. Um, there might not be, but we can make one. OK, great. Yeah. Yes. 
Awesome. All right. Well, thanks. Okay. Thanks. So I'll see if I can see something. All right. Okay, that's a lot to digest. But as soon as you start to go into the uh, readme in detail, things are actually quite logical. So um, you know, just go through that carefully. Um, that's most most of the work in uh, milestone one is really just to go through these uh, you know the readmes and you know take the steps. It shouldn't take more than an hour for you to finish, right? Okay. So uh, and a lot of these things, if you don't do it once. Towards the end of the semester, you'll pay for it. Okay, so well, we're just trying to get you to do the right thing so that uh, you you can be efficient, um, you know, towards the end. Okay, thanks, Carl. So um, we are um, at the point where uh, we understood um, the uh, perceptrons, and um, we formulated the perceptron as um, all the inputs, and uh, going through this matrix. And then, uh, so input vector, matrix, and then uh, output vector, right? So um, today we're going to uh, go deeper uh, into the neural net. And we already started that a little bit on Thursday last week, OK? And we, we talked a little bit about the background of the, uh, the neural net. And neural net has been around for a long, long time. And uh, when I was a grad student, uh, neural net was one of the, the most I would say that the, the hottest topic among the grad students, all of us have you know, coffee, beer, whatsoever. We all talk about neural net. And they, it died. Okay, it just died. And then uh, you know, the, uh, after the uh, GPUs came, uh, uh, you know, came and started to have you know, the, uh, the kind of throughput that uh, we need to have in order to process a lot of data, neural nets started to come back. That was a 2012 story that I told you from Toronto, Jeff Hinton's group, and a uh, bunch of grad students who took uh, you know, the, uh, one of the early versions of 408 from Professor uh, Andreas Machilvis. So this is a, a kind of a quintessential neural net that uh, everyone uses as an example. And uh, this neural net has uh, you know, a few layers. And um, uh, the first uh, layer here is a, a convolution layer that we're going to uh, talk about. And then after the convolution layer, we're going to generate a bunch of these output feature maps. And these feature maps will go through the subsampling uh, layer so that uh, we can shrink things into uh, smaller, you know, that we can shrink the number of pixels. And uh, also introduce nonlinearity. Remember that nonlinearity we needed to do to reposition data. And that's, this is exactly what it is. So then, um, so we're going to do another convolution. So we're going to generate smaller, but a lot, even more of these outputs. And then uh, we will do a subsampling again to generate even smaller outputs. And then we use the fully connected layer with perceptrons to be able to, you know, to, uh, to take all these final images and put, hash them into probabilities. Okay, so that's, you know, what this particular neural net is organized for. And it, the input is going to be a 32 by 32 pixel, just a handwriting okay, a character. And uh, this is, act, uh, remember, we talk about the, uh, the learning, you know, how we can learn a truth table, right? And uh, this is actually an extremely big, you know, truth table because you have 32 by 32 is 1,024 values, right? And each value is a pixel. So that each pixel is eight more bits. So we're talking about uh, 8,000 bits in, you know, in the input. And that gives us 2 to the 8,000, you know, right? 2 to the 8,000 uh, number of possible truth table entries, right? So that, that's the whole reason why I was going through this foundational material to make sure that you understand that even a very small handwriting, you know, 32 by 32 pixel image can give you a tremendous amount of space in terms of learning. Okay, so, so you know how many the 
the total number of different truth table entries that you will need to provide in order to fully learn you know, what needs to be done. So instead, what we're doing here is we're using the convolution layer and the subsampling layer to whittle down the size of the data. Okay? So you start with this, you know, this piece of data, and then we do the convolution. And the convolution is going to take us down just a little bit. It's a, f a five by five uh, you know, the convolution mask. So we're going to actually going to get 28 by 28 images. I'm going to come back to this point. The convolution here is slightly different than the convolution that you did. We're not going to use ghost cells. So we're actually going to take the edge uh, cells or edge pixels of the input image as the ghost cells. So that's why we're generating a smaller image. But that's not the main mechanism for beating down the size. The, why, the way that we're really beating down the size is by subsampling. Okay, so that's where uh, this is where uh, this one is. So we, we, we would reduce the size by two uh, in each dimension. So that gives us from 22, uh, 28 to 28 to 14 by 14. And then we generate another convolution. So that's a 5 by 5 that uh, brings us down to 10 by 10, because we are taking down another two points on each side from the convolution. And then we do another subsampling. And so that will be dividing by half, uh, by two, on each, uh, in each dimension. So we'll get 5 by 5. So these are truly very, very small, OK? Very, very small images, 5 by 5 pixel images. And then that's where we can start to use fully connected uh, you know, the layers, the perceptrons, to be able to do a full logic you know, translation from the pixels into probabilities. Okay, so that's where you know what uh, we we have enough of the kind of the data compression and extracted essentially the various parts of this picture into these smaller pieces and shrink. They are shrinked from big to small in different ways, so that uh, we can you know uh, be able to detect different shifting, you know, slight shifting of the handwriting, slight tilting of the handwriting, and so on. And they will be all kind of captured in all these little images. And we use those to determine the, uh, the probability, whether this is number 0 through 9, the probability for that. Yes? Uh, Ah, OK. So uh, you know, the feature maps is really just a fancy name for, uh, for computer vision. So basically, uh, you, know, you start with the image. And then as soon as you, you apply convolution, and um, you start to get, you know, uh, because the convolution mask gives you different types of emphasis and different types of you know, shifting and so on, right? So, so uh, that essentially tells you you're extracting a, you know, a more interpretable image out of the original image. And each of these smaller interpretable image is called a feature map. That's really. Yeah, yeah. So the masks will be involved here. And I'm actually going to go into that right away. OK, very good question. So feature maps. <laughs> so um, essentially, uh, when we look at a convolution layer, um, this is really the mental picture that uh, I want you to keep all the time when you work on your uh, project. So we start with the input, uh, input feature maps. And uh, uh, so you know, at the very beginning, we only have one image. Right? So at the beginning, if we look at the, uh, the, in, the convolution layer at the input layer, and uh, there's only one input feature map coming into the uh, convolution layer. So uh, in that case, the, what we call this uh, number of channels will be one. So the number of channels refers to the, you know, the number of input images feeding into the convolution layer. Okay. And um, uh, so if we look at the, uh, the number of channels for this input uh, convolution layer, the channel, it, there's only one channel. But then for this second convolution layer right here, we have you know, uh, six of these uh, output feature maps from the previous stage. And these six, um, you know, six images become six channels, okay, into the next convolution layer. Okay, so um, the you know, typically we'll have more and more and more channels 
simply because we're breaking down the original image into more and more parts. And each part gives us a channel in, uh, of information right, into our classification system. The, um, the middle part is the convolution layer. Essentially, this layer needs to have a large number of weight uh, masks or the uh, weight uh, you know, uh, uh, matrices. And these are k by k, usually k by k, but in general, they can be, you know, not just 5 by 5, could be 5 by 7 or 7 by 9. So in general, we will say it's k1 by k2. But for your final project, we're going to only use a square, uh, you know, uh, masks to make things a little bit simpler for you. And then the output, the output feature map is essentially the, the smaller images that we're going to generate out of the convolution layer, slightly smaller images. And uh, so, you know, the, as, we, as I mentioned, each dimension of the output image is going to be small, slightly smaller than the input dimensions. And the reason is we're going to take the full input image and we're going to uh, use the edge pixels as ghost cells. So if, let's say if we have a 5 by 5 mask, two of the pixels on each uh, each edge are going to be treated as ghost cells or ghost pixels. So uh, the output is actually going to be only corresponding to the core of the input. And all these additional input images on the edge will be just used as convolution input to generate the output. Uh, you know, the output. So if we have 32 by 32 and then we have 5 by 5 pick, uh, masks, we're going to generate uh, you know, 32 minus 4, 28. So there will be only 28 by 28 in the output. Okay? Yes. We do, but uh, those values are being, you know, already being kind of included through convolution, right, into the into the output. So uh, I'm going to actually show you that in, in, uh, in a few slides. So you know, I just want to make sure that everyone's oriented properly in a global, sort of in a high level way, right, as we go into these detailed examples. So we do have a lot of convolution masks in this process. If we have start with a number of inputs, the number of input channels is A, and we want to generate B output feature maps, then we will need to provide A times B sets of masks, and these are all different masks, or different weight values. All these values will need to be learned or trained in the training process. Okay, remember when we talk about the chain rule, right? And so that chain rule will be used to set the value of all these weights, okay, all these weights in the process. Okay, so before going into the details of convolution, I do want to also mention a little bit about the pooling layer. Um, the pooling layer is not the focus of our, uh, of our uh, 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 final project because the pooling layer has a lot less computation than the convolution layer. So, you know, it's, it's just uh, it's not as fun um, you know, to try to optimize the pooling layer compared to the convolution layer. And uh, so this pooling layer, uh, pooling is a kind of a term for, uh, you know, machine learning. It's really uh, about uh, subsampling and nonlinearity. So it is a, a subsampling layer, and uh, sometimes you ju you just add. You know, most of the time, you will add bias and nonlinearity. Remember, when we talk about the perceptron, we not only talk about that you know multiplication side. We also have that bias, right? And then we have a sigmoid, right? But for the convolution, the convolution only replaces that matrix vector multiplication. Okay, you still need to have the biases and the nonlinearity, and that is implemented in the pooling layer, in the, sub, uh, you know, in the subsampling layer. And when we do the pooling layer, we typically will take multiple bits, okay, multiple pixels in a region, uh, in, in kind of uh, take multiple pixels in the input and generate only one pixel from the, uh, uh, in the output. So that let's say if we have a, you know, uh, two times two, four times subsampling, what we do is we take every four pixels, we only generate one pixel output so that the picture will be smashed down by two times in each direction. 
And the way that we smash down the, you know, the size is by taking those, let's say, four pixels, and we can take random sample. We can just say randomly we take one of the values and put that in, right? We can also do an average. We can just say we are going to take these four values, we do an average value and put it in. And that will be equivalent to uh, the uh, image uh, blurring because we're taking the, neighbor, you know, the neighboring images and then we kind of blur them together, but then we do a subsample afterwards to make a smaller image. And this is a very typical way of you know, generating smaller images from big images. Because if you generate a small image from a big image, you need to blur it a little bit just so that you don't have these abrupt changes once you do the subsampling. Then you need to smooth things out a little bit, and then you do the subsampling. And uh, you know, we do that for sound, we do that for you know, uh, uh, movies and so on all the time. And then we can also use you know, max value, L2 norm value, weighted average. We can do all kinds of uh, fancy tricks for advanced machine, you know, uh, uh, sort of the more advanced research type of uh, you know, machine learning. So um, it helps the uh, representation to be able to, you know, to, do, to have some invariant in size scaling and small translation in the input, right? So you know, basically, um, if we have a, a situation where the, you know, the size of the handwriting is a little bit bigger or a little bit smaller, when you do this kind of subsampling along the way, you will begin to expose the different sizes and so on to the final, to, to, to the final uh, layer in, your, uh, you know, in the uh, classification. So uh, we already talked about this, but uh, I just want to remind everyone, uh, you know, why do we go with convolution rather than uh, you know, the, uh, the fully connected layer? The reason is, um, you know, in a lot of the real world classification problems, you know, when you get an image, you're not really trying to classify the entire image, but you're actually trying to classify many, many objects in that image. And the collective classification of all these objects give you the classification of that image. If I take a picture of the class here, you know, the, the, probably the most meaningful classification will be the faces of all of you, right? So then, so each one will be a very small portion of that uh, image. So, um, you know, for, uh, for these classification applications, every time we see a big picture, we want to be able to have localized, okay, localized classification for different regions of the picture, and then we summarize the total classification based on all the individual classifications. That's why whenever, you know what, we do a localized smaller classification like facial, expression, uh, facial recognition, we can break down the image into you know, many, many different smaller sections and each one will give us a face that uh, we can do the classification. And that's what the, you know, the, uh, the convolution is about because convolution gives you that mask and it gives you that you know, localized computation when you to go from input to output. And um, so, but on the other hand, at some point, you need to have a summary classification. That's why you almost always see a fully connected layer at the very end of your, of your neural network. And that's when you have all these localized classification already, and you say, okay, time to summarize everything into a big uh, you know, final classification. So if we look at the, uh, the convolution, you, you know, this is kind of the, uh, the, uh, the mental, uh, this car drew this picture pretty nicely. You have this input here, okay? You have this, uh, you know, uh, the, uh, the input here. And then uh, uh, the input will you know, be con convolved with this mask. So this region of the input will be convolved with this region, uh, the, uh, the mask, and then we'll generate this picture, uh, pixel. And another region, in the input will be convolved with the same mask and then we generate a pixel here. So that's why we have all these simultaneous localized you know, uh, you know, classification going on in that picture. And um, so you know, basically this is one weight mask that we will use to go from one input to one output. We will have multiple inputs, okay? Remember the, those channels. So each channel and output combination, we're going to also be generating multiple outputs. Each input channel and output feature map pair 
requires a unique weight, okay, set of weights. So it will require one unique mask, right? So that uh, you know, that's we already mentioned that, and I want to make sure that you, uh, you know, it it, uh, it really hits home. So you have convolution, you have multi-layer perceptrons, and um, uh, you know you already have taken an exam. So you know this is the matrix vector multiplication that we had in the exam, right? And now uh, we're learning how we're going to be using convolution, and this will bring down the amount of you know weights that you need to pro uh, to train, right? So you know, with, uh, if you need to do it, uh, always do a full multi-level perceptron. You're going to need to train a lot more weights, okay? And also uh, for convolution, um, you know, so we we would need to train fewer weights, and also every input pixel is only going to be involved in these you know, smaller region of convolution rather than everyone is involving every output, right? So that gives you less computation cost as well. So let's get into the, um, you know, the input, sort of the, uh, the convolution layer, the forward propagation aspect of it. So we already mentioned this. Input features, right? Input features, so these are the channels, the channels. And then you have the output features, and these are the output feature maps. And um, so we have all these weights, and each pair of these will find its own weight, right? Its own weight to do the convolution. So that this is the summary picture that you should always keep in your head. So uh, going back to some of the, uh, the questions about the weights, if we look at the input, you know, let's say we have three channels in the bottom, okay, so, uh, you know, this is one of the intermediate uh, you know, convolution layers. Assuming that we have three input channels and we want to generate two output feature maps, okay? Feature, output feature maps could be more or fewer, okay? Then the, uh, you know, the input feature maps. In general, we do generate more and more and more output feature maps. But there are some classifiers that would you know, occasionally go down. So you, you could be generating fewer output feature maps out of your uh, input uh, feature maps. So uh, here is you know, uh, the picture that we show that for every pair, so let's say uh, Z, input feature map zero to output feature map zero, we will need to have this particular weight uh, you know, uh, uh, mask. So that's why when we have three channels and two outputs, we're going to need to have six of these unique masks, and each one will be used in, uh, you know, uh, to, to uh, generate the output. So if you, if you look at the output, one thing to remember, one thing to remember mentally, and this is going to be very, very useful for your, uh, writing your kernel, okay, is that um, um, in order to generate this output, I'm going to need to have input from all the three channels, okay? I'm going to need information from all the three channels. Here, here, and here. Okay, so that's the, the first, you know, the first thing to remember. Every output does take every input into consideration. Okay, it's just that for every input, every output pixel is only affected by a certain localized set of pixels. But they, they are these pixels do come from all the input channels. So the second one is every input is also going to affect all, every output. So this input is going to affect the uh, uh, output zero and it's also going to affect output one through these different uh, masks, right? So we're really still having, you know, at every layer, every input has something to say about every output feature map, okay? And it's just that the pixels in the individual pixels are being affected by a localized set of pixels from the input. Yes, question? Exactly, exactly. So it's an accumulated convolution. That the question is, the question is, is, this doesn't seem to be the standard convolution, and the answer is absolutely right. It's really the accumulated convolution from all the if input feature maps. So you can just combine all the maps together and then, like, go to one map. 
you could. Uh, so the question is, why don't we uh, just combine the masks together? And in fact, uh, when we talk about the matrix multiplication formulation, um, that's you know, essentially what it is. OK. OK. So let's take a look at the sequential code. So this is the code that Carl wants, you to, wants to see in your milestone two, I believe, uh, you know, the submission. So uh, you, know, uh, you, you have this, you know, essentially, the convolution layer will take what, you know, if you have a sequential code, the sequential code will loop through all the images in a batch. Remember that batch thing that we talked about, the mini batch, right? So, um, you know, in each batch, we're going to have, you know, a capital B number of images. So, you, you know, it will just loop through all the images. And then uh, it will uh, generate, you know, it will loop through all the output feature maps that we want to generate for each image, right? Each input image will end up generating multiple output, uh, you know, feature maps, right? So, you know, so we're going to take the, you know, the, uh, the output, Essentially, the, uh, the, we're, we're going to iterate through all the output feature maps we're going to generate. And then for each output feature map, there are just pixels. So we're going to go through all the output feature, all the pixels of each output feature map and do the cal calculation. In order to generate that pixel, you should be expecting convolutions from all the inputs and accumulation. Right? So that's, you know, that's what you should be expecting, so which is absolutely true. We will initialize the pixel to zero. Okay, we'll initialize the pic, uh, pixel to zero. And then we will take, we'll go through all the input channels, right? For each, you know, each data point in the, uh, in the uh, uh, batch, these are the channels for, uh, you know, that consists of that data point. And then for every uh, pixel, so all the channels, and then uh, so essentially, remember we're we're trying to operate on one output, generate one output pixel. So the way that we generate that output pixel HW index is by looping through the convolution, right? So we're looping through the uh, you know all the pixels that are around the, that particular output pixel. And then we generate, we use the correct weight matrix to be able to select the right weight value. So the, that's why you see that the weight matrix is indexed with M and C. M is the output, uh, the output uh, uh, feature map index, and C is the channel index. So every combination will give you one unique P and Q okay, uh, mask. Right? So this is why. These things are called tensor operation because every data that we're using is a you know, multi-dimensional, high-dimensional array. And the, this is a weight is going to be a four-dimensional array, and it's essentially a four-dimensional tensor. tensor okay? And then uh, you know, x is going to be you know, gen, uh, you know, uh, indexed with the, uh, um, you know, with the batch and the channel. And um, uh, the output is going to be generated by the uh, batch and channel. There is a missing B here, so uh, we'll correct that uh, after. These uh, typos are annoying. They're, you know, they're like cockroaches. Um, you, know, you kill some of them, more come back for some reason. So here, here is a, a very simple, uh, you know, small convolution example, and um, uh, we're sh showing that uh, you know we have these three channels, three channels of you know, input features. And then we were, uh, we're going to generate one output you know, feature map. So uh, basically, um, you know, in order for, for us to access the data structure, um, we're going to have the uh, x and w both be uh, act. The x is going to be accessed through the, uh, the batch index. And then the input channel will be used to access both x and w. And the output map is going to be access, used to both access the output and the W, right? So this, this is that unique combination that we're talking about. So let's say if we're trying to generate the output feature map zero, okay, the pixel zero, zero in the output feature map zero, right? So you know, what's going to happen? 
So we're going to take the, the upper left corner of x that is centered on this one thing, one here, right? This is the center here. And we have a 3 by 3, we have a 3 by 3 mask. So we're going to do a convolution, and we're going to write into the corner. So this is what I mean. You know what? We are still using the input values, OK? But these input values are treated as essentially as the ghost values and the, the you know, halo values, right? So yeah. Yes, they will contribute less to the output, absolutely. And uh, you know, so we already did that analysis. All the edge elements will contribute, you know, the, uh, what we used to call the halo or the, uh, the ghost elements, right? The halo elements in the tiles are used fewer times, which is exactly the, the, the case here. So you, you are going to be slightly emphasizing the contribution of the edge pixels into your uh, output feature map, absolutely. So then um, you would, you know, uh, take, do the next iteration. Remember, you know what? Uh, I'm going to in the sequential code. I'm going to iterate through the output pixels, right? We we iterate through the output feature maps, and then for each output feature map, we're going to be iterating through the pixels, right? Generate the pixels. So now we're gen we're focusing on this pixel zero zero, and then we have the inner loop, right? The inner loop that will iterate through the channels, right? And for every channel, we're going to be doing this little convolution innermost double loop, right, that goes through the uh, three by three, nine elements in the innermost loop, the P and Qs, right? So this is the second channel, and then you have the third channel, and so you have the three plus six plus 11 accumulated, uh, you know, the, so this is the three plus six uh, plus 11, which is the convolution value for the last one. So you have all these accumulation, eventually you get a 51 out of all the three convolutions, okay? So this is the sequential code. And um, we have that sequential code in textbook. So you should be able to just take that code and, you know, I would say, for the heck of it, you know, don't copy that code, okay? Just go in and, and write it, okay? There is a, really a high level of satisfaction when you just go ahead and write a piece of code. Okay? I still like it, you know, I still like to, to, you know, to go and just, you know, write out the piece of code. And my students keep yelling at me and said, why do you want to write that code? I already wrote that code. I said, oh, it's time for me to write it. So you should definitely, you know, whenever you have an opportunity, write it. About 10 years ago, no, 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 oh, actually it's 20 years ago now. I used to say it's 10 years ago. 10 years ago, when I said it was 10 years ago. So it was 20 years ago. Um, a bunch of my grad students came to my office and said something happened yesterday with our daily build. Uh, you know, well, we have a fairly big you know, software infrastructure. In fact, you know, when Carl was talking about all the servers and so on, right? Who wrote those kind of code? Imagine, my grad students, okay? So, you know, so we have a fairly large infrastructure and you know, people are developing. And um, they said, something strange happened. I said, what? They said, uh, you know, our daily build totally broke. And you know, what, the, we, it took us an hour to track down what happened. And I was like, uh-oh. So uh, I was playing with some of the code the night before, and then uh, you know, I didn't do it quite right. <laughs> so I broke it. <laughs> and so, uh, they, they, you know, so that's why four or five of them came to my office. You know, none of them are there to come to my, my, my office uh, by himself or herself. So all of them came together and said, from this point on, you worry about paper writing, and we worry about coding. <laughs> so, okay. <laughs> So, but still, every, every time I get a chance, I still like to kind of play with the code. So, you know, basically, you know, this should become one of your habits. You know, what, uh, you know when you become a professor, remember, you know, don't break your grad student's code. You know, that, that's absolutely true. But uh, still, whenever you get a chance, play with it, okay? So, um, you know, there's a bunch of parallelism in this convolution layer. So this goes to the next milestone, okay? So, you know, you're supposed to craft a kernel that will, uh, you know, that will be executed by the grid to compute the output layers. And by now, it should be very clear to you that it's not just the simple convolution code that you had in your MP because of the accumulation, right? It's a combined, it's a cumulated convolution from all the uh, input uh, channels. Yes? Yeah, uh, no, no, the, the layers are predefined because MXNet actually has these predefined layers. So when you go into the, when you download, you will see all, the, all that structure. 
Absolutely. Yeah, that's the reason why um, we also wanted to make sure that um, you know, we, we get you to work in a, um, a widely used framework, because the frameworks typically set up these things in particular ways. So even though you, you may be theoretically totally capable of doing all, any of these layers, if you're not familiar with how these things are set up in practice by these layers, you, 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 can, you, know, you can have all kinds of difficulty trying to introduce your work into these uh, you know, frameworks. Very good question. So all the output uh, map uh, you know, uh, uh, pixels can be generated in parallel. Uh, you know, the, the way I, I describe this you know, in the way that I go through all the output feature maps, right? And I go through all the pixels in each output feature map. Why did I say that? Because all these things can be done in parallel. The generation of each pixel in the output feature map is independent of any other pixels in that feature map. You're just grabbing values from the input, the, the right values from the input. And, and so just like convolution, all the outputs are, can be generated in parallel. It's just that it involves collecting more of the convolution results from uh, the input uh, uh, channels. The second one is all the maps themselves can be uh, you know, uh, processed in parallel. So generating map 0 versus map 1 versus map 2, all those you know, maps can be generated in parallel. So, you know, so we have all kinds of parallelism that um, you know, we can exploit in this computation. This is the reason why GPUs have been so good in you know, doing these kind of computation. You, know, the, uh, you, you really can uh, exploit a whole lot of parallelism out of these things. There's one little caveat. If you want to process all the input channels in parallel, you need to be careful. Because remember, all the channels will be contributing to, the, uh, you know, to all the feature maps, uh, output feature maps. So if I want to process all the channels in parallel, they will be simultaneously trying to, to accumulate into the output. And um, we have not talked about the uh, atomic operations and so on, but um, you know, we will. Uh, the reason why we, you know, we have not talked about it is because we moved the project uh, for, uh, uh, earlier. So you know, usually by the time we introduce the, the project, we already talked about histogramming and accumulation and atomic operations. But now uh, you know, it will be covered a little bit later. But, uh, but this is something that I want you to remember. If we really want to process all the input channels in parallel, we will need to use atomic operations. And that will have some implications on the throughput that we can achieve you know, with, uh, you know, with that parallelism. So let's do a very simple design. You don't have to follow this, by the way. I'm just giving you a, a, a fairly simple design. And you can use each block. Uh, you know, to uh, to process to compute a tile of output pixels. So I, I look at my output feature maps, and we I take each chunk of uh, tile of output pixels from each feature map and say, okay, every block will compute one of these, right? So essentially, I break down the output feature map into these tiles of pixels. This is not any different from the MP. Okay, the MP does take the output and break down, uh, break down the output image into tiles. But now we just have multiple output feature maps. So we have these you know, multiple tiles for multiple output images that we, we need to generate. And um, then so we can use the, you know, the uh, sort of the x dimension to, uh, you know, to, uh, to process all the m output feature maps. So if I look at the thread blocks, we, I can use the x dimension to assign the thread blocks into the output feature maps. So basically, if I look at the picture here, um, I can think about my CUDA grid. If I want to use a two-dimensional grid, two-dimensional two grid to process, to generate all my output feature maps, I can use one of the dimensions to index into one of the output feature maps. Right. So all the threads in this in this row will be processing output feature map 0 and output feature map 1, 2, and 3, right? So four columns of you know, thread blocks, and each thread block will be processing, you know, all these thread blocks in the same column will be processing the same, uh, generating the same output 
image. Okay? And then I can say my other direction, you know, y the y uh, dire uh, dimension, I'm going to use, I'm going to linearize the, uh, you know, the, the tiles in the output feature map into, you know, into these uh, different tiles that I can uh, map the blocks to. So here, let's say if my output feature map has four, two by two, four tiles. These are tiles, okay? So then I can simply map zero, one, two, zero, one, two, three, and I just linearize it in zero, one, two, three. So then I can use the white block index to select one of the tiles in the output feature map in that same uh, in that output feature map, so that uh, you know each of these output feature maps will be mapped in a linearized way. They said, why do you bother to do this? You know, why do you bother to linearize your uh, you know your tiles in the output feature map into one y direction? Because from our experience, you want to also reserve the z direction for uh, you know multiple of the images in a batch. Okay, you want to be able to launch even more of the threads to you know to process the uh, images in that in the uh, in the same batch. So we usually want to reserve one more direction, you know, dimension in our thread dimension to be able to handle multiple data points in that batch. So so that's why this is a very frequent trick. We linearize the you know the tiles in two dimensions into one dimension so that uh, we can use one of the thread, dim uh, thread block uh, grid dimensions to be able to process multiple tiles in the same output, okay? And uh, this is a, a very common pattern that we do whenever we, uh, we handle what we call the high dimensional data. Whenever we have you know, uh, data that has you know, more than three dimensions, oftentimes when we map three-dimensional parallelism, right? Fundamentally, we're taking the threat grid that is organized into three dimensions to process data that has higher dimensionality, four dimensions, five dimensions. So that's why we will need to fold some of the dimensions into a single dimension to be able to fit that into the, you know, in, uh, into the kind of the limited dimension. So at the beginning of the semester, um, you know, one of you asked me, you know, why why do we you know, want to have these three-dimensional grids and uh, three-dimensional blocks? And you know, so I said, hey, you know what? This is because we, you know, it simplifies our mapping right? From, you know, uh, for processing multi-dimensional data. And we will be seeing more and more of these even higher dimensional data, especially in the data analytics, okay? that three dimensions are not even enough. Okay? So next time, uh, I'm going to be in Chicago next week because uh, we're, we're going to do a similar thing. You know, Carl and I will try to, you know, to, uh, to take, uh, you know, to spend some time in, with the Chicago students and make sure that they can start, uh, you know, the, they can, they can uh, kick off the project uh, properly. They didn't have a lot of time, uh, chance to ask questions today. So next time, uh, I will be starting with this and talk about the kernel code that you will be writing and the host code you'll be writing as an example. Okay, and then you can begin to be creative and think about these things on your own. Okay, so I will uh, see you on Tuesday.